In this program, we've introduced you to lots of project management artifacts, such as project plans, statements of work, RACI charts, and more. Now, we'll review an important artifact of the Scrum framework, the product backlog. In an earlier video, we defined the product backlog as the single authoritative source for things that a team works on. It contains all of the features, requirements, and activities associated with deliverables to achieve the goal of the project. The traditional, non-agile project management equivalent would be the set of project requirements. There are three key features of a product backlog. First, the product backlog is a living artifact, meaning that items are added to the backlog at any time. The product backlog evolves throughout the whole life cycle of the project and serves as a central guide for the team to know what to work on next. Second, the product backlog is owned and adjusted by the product owner. And finally, the product backlog is always a prioritized list of features. So when there's new information or new features, those are added to the backlog in order of importance. The items at the very top of the list are very specific and well-defined, leaving the more vague items for the bottom of the list. Remember, the product backlog is the guide and roadmap of your product. It's the central artifact in Scrum, where all possible ideas, deliverables, features, or tasks are captured for the team to work on. Because the backlog is so central, there are a few best practices and pieces of data to capture when working with product backlogs. There's the description, the value, the order, and the estimate. Let's go through how to build a sample backlog with these best practices in mind. First, there's the item description. The item description is exactly what it sounds like. It describes an item. When you're writing an item description, it's a good idea to be really clear when adding product backlog items, so the details are encouraged. For instance, on Office Green's new project, Virtual Verde, here's an example of an item description. As a Virtual Verde client, I plan to grow my choice of vegetables while I work from home in my New York City apartment. This item description includes essential details, such as an action and a location from the perspective of the customer. This ensures that the development team has enough information to meet the user's needs. Next up, we have the value field. This is the field that tells us how much business value the item delivers to the customers, to the team, or to the users. How to indicate value is a choice the Scrum team should make together. I like to set value by using dollar signs, ranging from $1 sign for low value all the way up to $4 signs for high added business value. Next, we have to add in an estimate. An estimate is how much effort the Scrum team thinks an item will take to complete. We'll explore how to do relative effort estimation coming up, but for now, it's important to know that the relative effort estimate is captured in each backlog item. This field in the backlog is owned by the development team. The next attribute of each backlog item is the order. As we mentioned, the backlog should always be prioritized. Both the estimate and value fields we just discussed help the product owner figure out where to place an item in the backlog's order of hierarchy. A product owner may ask themselves, how important is this backlog item compared to all the other items? Product backlogs order items from highest to lowest priority. This is called a stacked rank. Ordering items this way allows teams to operate more efficiently. For example, our Virtual Verde market research team learned that people who work from home would much rather have plants that are easy to take care of versus a more high maintenance plant like orchids. Then the team prioritizes the simple and easy plants on the backlog, like succulents, higher than the orchids. So their product backlog lists one, succulents, two, orchids. But say for example, support gets an email from a user who says they'd love to have bonsai trees, which are also hard to take care of. Where do we put it in the order? Before orchids or after? The product owner does some research and decides that the team will do orchids first because they find that many more users have requested orchids versus bonsai trees. The product owner gives orchids a $2 sign value rating, bonsai trees a $1 sign value rating, and puts bonsai trees last on their list. Awesome, let's move on. When creating backlog items, the goal is to include as much as you can while not stressing about the unknowns too much. For example, the product owner in Virtual Verde doesn't know yet how much bonsai trees cost compared to succulents, so they don't know if they serve a high-end market or a low-end market. They document an assumption in the bonsai tree description and move on. They can study that in more detail when it is higher on the priority list. 
So now you know a bit more about defining the product backlog and who owns it. We also discussed how the various roles work with a product backlog, and we can identify and describe each field in a product backlog. Now that you know about the various fields associated with each item in your backlog, let's discuss a popular way to capture and manage those backlog items, user stories. User stories are short, simple descriptions of a feature told from the perspective of the user. This helps the team create a solution that's always centered around the user and the user experience. User stories might start off large and broad, or maybe broken down to be as small or specific as possible. In this lesson, we're going to give you some ideas on how to write user stories and how to break them down. User stories are made up of three different elements, the user, the action they will take, and the benefit to them. These elements might have a few different formats, but the most common is, as a user role, I want this action so that I can get this value. When writing effective user stories, the team must have a user in mind. Imagine that the user will interact with the product in order to achieve a specific outcome. What I really like to do at this stage is create personas or detailed descriptions of my different users. Sometimes I even give them names. So in Virtual Verde, we could give our users some names and some information about them. Here are some user persona ideas. Leo is my plant vendor who manages acquiring the plants, the supply chain, and delivery logistics. Felicity is my gardening expert who helps my support team give our customers really excellent advice on how to take care of their plants. Zach is my amateur vegetable gardener who wants to use the plants they purchase to make dinner. Nia is my management consultant who works from home and wants to set up a professional backdrop for video conferences in their home office. Rena is my flower aficionado who wants to have a different flower arrangement each week to brighten up their home. By giving these users a name and a backstory, we can imagine them in our minds and we will design better products for them as a result. I really enjoy writing user stories because it puts me in the shoes of my users. Each user story should meet six different criteria, represented by the acronym INVEST or INVEST. I for independent. The story should be able to be started and finished by itself. It's not dependent on another story to finish it. The N stands for negotiable. There's room for negotiation and discussion about this item. The V is for valuable. This means that completing the user story has to deliver value. E is for estimable. Our definition of done must be clear so that the team can give each user story an estimate. The S is for small. Each user story needs to be able to fit within a planned sprint. If that user story is too big, it should be broken down into smaller stories. Stories that are low priority on the backlog can stay big until they become a priority for an upcoming sprint. And finally, the T is testable. A test can be written to check and make sure that it meets the acceptance criteria. While the product owner is the main person responsible for writing user stories, the team has a responsibility to give feedback on whether the user story is clear and fits the invest criteria before they invest any time into it. In addition to user stories, you need to know the term epic, which simply represents a group or collection of user stories. Some epics for Virtual Verde might be live plant delivery, office plant advice service, vendor management, or client data management. Let's come up with a sample user story for our Virtual Verde clients in the live plant delivery epic. As a Virtual Verde client, I would like to acquire a bonsai tree so that I can have a beautiful plant and I can meditate as I trim the branches. I thought of this one because I bought a bonsai tree for my 12-year-old nephew last year. And he did some research and learned that in Japan, pruning bonsai trees is a meditative practice. So he's learning how to do that. With that sample user story, the product owner creates something called the acceptance criteria which is essentially the checklist you will use to decide whether the user story is done. To have a completed user story, you must meet the acceptance criteria checklist. Here's an example of acceptance criteria for the bonsai tree user story. User can browse for three different types of bonsai trees to purchase. Compare the three trees to know which is easiest and hardest to grow in their home. Maybe each plant has a beginner, intermediate, and advanced gardener notation next to it. 
can purchase specific bonsai tree care packages like fertilizer, trimming shears, etc. Access online to a bonsai booklet sheet, as well as having a care booklet packaged with the tree. Can find a troubleshooting bonsai tree issues page on Virtual Verde's FAQ page. Sounds like an amazing story, doesn't it? It feels like a real thing that a user can interact with and get excited about. Each user story in the backlog should be written this way. It's natural for items higher in the priority list to have more detail and fewer gray areas. By leaving these low priority items vague, this saves the team time from working on items that may end up getting deprioritized down the road. We've been exploring everything there is to know about a product backlog. Although the product owner owns or is in charge of the data in the backlog, the team must work together to keep the living document up to date. In this video, we'll discuss how to do that through a process called backlog refinement. Backlog refinement refers to the act of keeping the backlog described, estimated, and prioritized so that the Scrum team can operate effectively. After the product owner has added the backlog items with a description and a value statement, they do backlog refinement. Backlog refinement is when the product owner and some or all of the Scrum team review the backlog to ensure it contains the appropriate items and that nothing new is needed or nothing needs to be removed, that the items are prioritized by the product owner, this is also called setting the order field, that the items at the top of the backlog are ready for delivery with clear acceptance criteria, and that the backlog items include estimates or an informed assessment about how much work a particular backlog item will be. Let's discuss estimates since they're crucial in backlog refinement. We add estimates to backlog items to inform our planning practices about how much effort it will be to finish each item or user story. Through estimation, we can find out how much work we have ahead of us. It can be difficult to estimate the amount of time it takes to complete a task. More often than not, we human beings tend to underestimate the time until completion. When it comes to big projects, this effect can be multiplied many times and can be the root cause of projects being late and over budget. So in Scrum, we try to overcome this problem by practicing relative estimation instead of absolute estimation. Absolute estimation is also called time and effort estimation in traditional project management. Relative estimation means that instead of trying to determine exactly how long a task will take, we compare the effort of that task to the effort for another task, and that becomes the estimate. That estimation is not done in traditional units of hours, days, or weeks. Instead, we assign each backlog item a value that is a relative unit for size. There are two common relative estimation methods that I find most useful when estimating user stories. These are t-shirt sizes and story points. Let's start with the simpler of the two, t-shirt sizes. To get started, the team simply picks one item on the backlog that seems to be about a medium-sized workload and simply calls that a medium in the estimate field. After that, they take another item on the backlog and compare it to the medium item they just identified and answer the question, if that first item was a medium, what size would I give this one? The team will repeat this process on each additional item or user story on the backlog until they're all addressed and done. For example, Let's take four items from Virtual Verde's product backlog. Adding bonsai trees to the catalog, creating a mobile app, launching a new logo, creating the new account page. The team decides that launching a new logo is their medium. The team together compares the other three items to that medium item, which gives them their relative effort estimate. Then there's my favorite method for estimating user stories, tasks, and backlog items, known as story points. Story points are a bit more advanced than t-shirt sizes, but the concept is similar. The first step is the same. The team picks an item as their anchor item, and they'll conduct their estimations relative to that item. Instead of using t-shirt sizes, this process uses what are called story points. Most teams use a famous mathematical sequence of numbers called the Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci sequence is 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, and continues on to infinity. These numbers are special in that they start out close to one another, but as the numbers get higher, they spread farther and farther out. This is helpful because as the estimate gets higher, the uncertainty and risk also gets higher. This number combines both effort and risk into one number. 
In other words, there's not much use in debating estimation values between 21 and 25 points, but choosing between 21 and 34 is a real conversation. This concept can be tricky at first, and practice is the best way to learn it. To explain this concept in the classes that I teach at Google, we use this example. Let's say you want to measure the effort to completely consume different kinds of fruit. You have in front of you an orange, a strawberry, a banana, a mango, a pineapple, and a cherry. What are the factors that go into that estimate? Are there seeds to deal with? Do I need to eat it with a napkin? Can I eat it in one bite? Do I have to peel it? Or do I need any tools to prepare it? Okay, let's try it. If I choose a mango as our starting fruit at five points, how might you estimate the rest? I would rate them this way. Orange, three because the peel is easier than cutting a mango. Strawberry, one, because I don't mind eating stems, low effort. Banana, three, because I have to peel it similar to oranges. Pineapple, 13, it's giant. I can't eat it in one sitting. And cherry, two, stems, seeds, you know what I mean. It's really fun to learn how differently people have learned how to cut up a pineapple. But more importantly, what estimation exercises do for a team is uncover great ideas on how to get something done, as well as surfacing where the riskiest parts of the project are. Why do I like story points better than t-shirt sizes? Let's apply them to our virtual Verde backlog. Now, we can see that adding a new user and adding bonsai trees to our catalog aren't quite the same size, which the t-shirt sizes might have implied. Using story points, a new user is eight points and the bonsai trees are 13. Why would I mark them this way? Well, implementing a new user page is a simple software update. Adding bonsai trees is more than just software. It includes finding vendors, building a supply chain, and more. I mentioned earlier that backlog refinement, which includes adding estimates and updating the order field, should take place regularly. Just as it's up to the team to choose which estimation method they select, it's up to the team to decide when and how often to conduct backlog refinement. Some teams prefer to set up special meetings just to refine the backlog. Others will simply refine the backlog continuously in conversations or emails. And finally, some teams will conduct backlog refinement as part of a scheduled event, like their sprint planning meeting. Now you know how to define backlog refinement and you can explain relative effort estimation t-shirt sizes, and story points. In the next video, we're going to learn more about sprint planning. Meet you there. As you learned earlier, sprints, which we also called iterations, provide the whole rhythm for the team and is one of the five Scrum events. They allow us to get feedback quicker, encourage team collaboration, and provide more focus for Scrum teams. Within a sprint, the amount of work is planned based on the historical capacity of the team and is made ready for the sprint planning event. It might help to think of each sprint as a mini project with planning, execution, delivery, closing, and a retrospective all wrapped into this bite-sized package. Sprints are so important to Scrum that the other four Scrum events revolve around the sprint. The Scrum Guide technically defines five events, the sprint itself, sprint planning, daily scrum, sprint review, and the sprint retrospective. Throughout this section of videos, I'll share what the recommended duration or time box is for each of these events. Time boxes are an important concept in scrum. Some examples of benefits are that they create a sense of urgency, which will drive prioritization, provide a window of focus, which improves productivity, and they help the team develop a predictable rhythm to their work. A sprint's time box can range anywhere from one to four weeks. How do you choose? Well, there are three considerations. First, think about what you expect the frequency of changes to be. How often do you think your requirements might change? If you expect your project to have new requests popping up each week, you may want to make your sprint length one week so that you can adapt more often. If the needs are more stable, perhaps longer will be just fine. Second, Think about how much focus time your solution developers might need to build a backlog item. If the baseline effort for most of your activities requires at least a week to create something valuable, 
then your sprint length should be at least two weeks to give the team room to execute without feeling the crunch mode. Third, think about how much overhead goes into a delivery of your product. If your deliverable or solution requires a large review with many stakeholders, or goes through a rigorous testing and quality assurance process that takes several days, you should factor that into your sprint length and choose a longer sprint, such as three or four weeks instead. Like most things in Scrum, there's no one size fits all. And if you set a sprint length and decide it's too long or too short after a few sprints, you can always change it. For example, my current team has sprints that are one week long because we expect a lot of change and new requests coming into our backlog every week. But often, our work takes longer than a week to complete. We're currently reflecting on that contradiction and considering changing our sprint length to two weeks. Great, now you know more about defining the sprint. For sprint planning, the entire Scrum team comes together and meets to confirm how much capacity, meaning time and people, are available during this sprint. And then they identify what items from the backlog will be done during the sprint. This becomes the sprint backlog and ultimately the sprint goal. This is a time for the Scrum Master to facilitate team communication and answer the following questions throughout the event. Who is available during this sprint? Are there any vacations or conflicts that we should know about? What has been our average velocity? Meaning, how many points or backlog items have we been able to complete in a single sprint in the past? What can and should be accomplished by the team in this upcoming sprint? What is the ultimate sprint goal? How will the work get done? Throughout the sprint, who is responsible for what tasks? We've discussed sprint lengths and story sizes, so let's explore the meaning of definition of done. Definition of done refers to an agreed upon set of items that must be completed before a user story or backlog item can be considered complete. Some things that may be within your definition of done are the code or solution itself is reviewed by an independent peer group. The product or unit passes all testing requirements, which could include security or performance testing. Documentation is completed. All user story acceptance criteria specified by the product owner is met. And finally, the product owner accepts the user story. This list isn't comprehensive, and the team should determine what should be on this list and improve it as needed. A key deliverable of the sprint planning event is the sprint backlog. The sprint backlog is the set of product backlog items that are identified for completion during the upcoming sprint. In other words, the sprint backlog is a subset of items from the product backlog that you'll aim to finish during that particular sprint. For example, Virtual Verde's product backlog might have 50 backlog items, and Virtual Verde has created four-week sprints that are named by month, May sprint, June sprint, July sprint, and so on. For the May sprint, the team has determined that they can complete the top five of those items based on the capacity of the team for May and the size of the effort of those items. Those five items now make up the sprint backlog. The sprint goal is the overarching objective that the team aims to achieve and helps the team understand the why of the sprint. This should be taken from a big picture view of the items on the sprint backlog. The benefit of having a bigger sprint goal identified is that it helps the team focus on a broader team objective rather than putting them into separate work streams. For example, let's say Virtual Verde has identified these five items as the sprint backlog for May. Virtual Verde users can purchase bonsai trees. Virtual Verde users can access an online discussion forum about home office decor. Virtual Verde vendor management team can add audit results for vendors. Virtual Verde users can use a coupon to purchase home office accessories. Virtual Verde customer support can connect products to support tickets. So the sprint goal is to provide a comprehensive experience to the user who wishes to install a bonsai tree in their home office. All of these backlog items can be connected to this sprint goal in some way. For example, there is a new coupon for bonsais, the vendors are audited for bonsai tree quality, and so on. As a refresher, 
One of the principles from the Agile Manifesto states, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. So in this video, we'll discuss communicating with the team through two kinds of face-to-face -face events that occurred during and after the sprint, the daily scrum and the sprint review. First, the daily scrum, which is sometimes referred to as stand-up, is a time for the scrum team to synchronize and prioritize activities for the day. In 15 minutes and at the same time and place every day, each team member answers the following questions. What did I do yesterday that helped the development team meet the sprint goal? What will I do today to help the development team meet the sprint goal? Do I notice any impediment that prevents me or the development team from meeting our goals? Daily stand-ups should provide the Scrum Master with the opportunity to quickly unblock the team with little delay. And daily stand-ups are an opportunity to reinforce focus on the sprint backlog and sprint goal. The official Scrum Guide says that daily stand-ups must happen every single day. Though I will say, I have had successful Scrum teams who meet less frequently than that. My current Scrum team has a one-week sprint and we have stand-ups two days during the week. We found that this works really well for us. Try it out and see what works best for your team. At the closing of a sprint, the team will complete another event known as the sprint review. This sprint event is crucial to the scrum pillars of inspection and adaptation and demonstrate the values of openness, courage, and respect. Let's discuss what I mean by that. The sprint review is a meeting with the entire scrum team where the product is demonstrated in order to determine which aspects are finished and which aren't. During a sprint review, the development team and product owner will play a heavy role in this inspection and discussion. They'll also cover an exploration of which items should be considered done in the product backlog. And they'll demonstrate and inspect the product. Sprint reviews should be really fun and uplifting. The sprint review is when the team gets to impress each other with the cool things they've accomplished over the last one to four weeks. These time-boxed meetings should not exceed four hours, and they're a good opportunity for the team to practice the scrum values of openness and respect as they give feedback about the completed work. Often, some of the greatest product ideas come out of the sprint review. Let's look at an example. With the new service, the Virtual Verde team needs to launch their new website page featuring home office plants. Let's imagine that the Scrum team has a marketing specialist on the team. Remember, Scrum teams are cross-functional. During the August Sprint Review meeting, one of the Sprint backlog items was to create a launch email to send out to their existing Plant Pals corporate customers about their brand new adventure. During the Sprint Review meeting, the team gets a demo of the email. They pull up the email onto the shared screen and give the specialist feedback right there in the meeting, such as, love that opening line, really draws them in. Let's make the opening image bigger. Can we make it easier for the recipient to forward this to their friends? Can we make this text shorter? It's a bit long. This group inspection of a work product from the team has many benefits that go way beyond just a better marketing email. First, it makes the feedback as immediate as possible. No need to wait for people to review on their own and send in their feedback later on. Feedback and adjustments might be made right there in the meeting. Second, everyone has a voice leading to a shared sense of ownership of every aspect of their product launch. Last but not least, the team learns more about how their marketing teammate does their job, leading to greater trust and understanding between team members. The sprint review is a time for the team to demonstrate what they've accomplished. The sprint review is also where team members unveil what is called the product increment. The product increment is what's produced after a given sprint and is considered releasable. A product is releasable when the team has developed a minimum viable product, which has a set of implemented features or requirements. A minimum viable product is a version of a product with just enough features to satisfy early customers. At the end of each sprint, only items that have met the definition of done are considered part of the product increment. Anything that is not done goes back to the product backlog. Great work! We've now covered the activities that happen during a sprint to ensure that the team is focused and is building valuable solutions. 
The sprint retrospective is an essential meeting of up to three hours for the Scrum team to take a step back, reflect, and identify improvements about how to work together as a team. In a sprint retrospective, the Scrum team will reflect on what's working or not working for the team regarding the people, the processes, and the tools. What improvements are worth exploring in the next sprint? And what improvements were put in place for the last sprint? Were they helpful or not, and why? In my experience, there are some key measures to take to ensure sprint retrospectives are a success. First, it's important to demonstrate the scrum value of respect and always allow the team to remain blameless. If any team member is worried there may be negative consequences for providing feedback, your outcome won't be as beneficial. You'll need to create a safe space for candor by acknowledging potential awkwardness, and if needed, create a space for anonymous or private feedback. Participation is key because retrospectives only work if participants feel like their input matters. If you notice folks aren't volunteering their perspectives, search for ways to generate new ideas, such as asking them, what is one thing we could try in the next sprint? What slowed us down? What happened that we didn't expect? The answers to these questions can help you understand how to improve. For example, just recently, my team discovered that having dependencies on stakeholders outside of our Scrum team was slowing us down. In our retrospective, we decided to increase awareness of our priorities with these external stakeholders through some new communication channels. Next, balance the negative with the positive. Don't just ask where you can improve, but also ask things like, where did we notice success? You want your team to feel like they were successful, and you also want to recreate these successful outcomes. And finally, make sure to act on it. Teams can get discouraged from participating in future retrospectives if it feels like their feedback won't inspire change. Search for improvements or simply convert the things that worked best into your team's habits and norms. Facilitating conversation among the Scrum team, both during retrospectives and in everyday workflows, is an incredibly important aspect of being the Scrum Master and a project manager. In this video, we'll explore two very important concepts that allow a Scrum team to manage their work as they progress through a sprint and the entire product backlog. These two concepts are burn down charts and velocity. Let's start with what a burn down chart's purpose is and how a Scrum team uses it. A burn down chart measures time against the amount of work done and the amount of work remaining. The goal of using a burn down chart is to keep the team aware of how they're doing against their overall goals. In a Scrum team, burn down charts reflect how the team is doing with completing user stories during the sprint. The Scrum Master will review the burn down chart sometimes daily, to examine if the team will hit their goals or not. And there's some simple math and numbers here, so now is a good time to mention what to do if your team is using t-shirt sizes rather than story points. In that case, simply map the sizes to a number and use that number for the burn down and velocity calculations. For example, maybe an extra small is one point, a small is two points, a medium is five, a large is eight, and so on. Here's an example. Let's imagine our virtual Verde team sprints are four weeks long, which will count as 20 business days. In their July sprint, the sprint backlog had stories that added up to a total of 200 points to be completed. If you assumed an even burn of points over the business days, you'd expect 10 points to be burned each day. By day five in their sprint, 22 points had been burned or completed. Hmm, okay, it's only 25% of their sprint, so maybe things are on track. By day 10, 45 points had been completed. Uh-oh, we should have been approximately halfway done by now, which would be 100 points. According to the burn down chart, we're running late, according to our sprint goal. Now, this isn't the time to panic and stress out the team. At this point, as Scrum Master, you should already be discussing with your team to find out how you can help and unblock them. By day 15, the burn down is 140 points. Phew, the team is back to humming along. By day 20, the burn down is 188 points completed. Great job. 
let's discuss what happened in the retrospective. In Scrum, there's a term for how many points a team burns down in a sprint on average. That term is velocity. In other words, velocity is a measure of how many points a team burns down during a single sprint on average. When the team is conducting sprint planning, they're using their average velocity over at least three sprints to determine how many items they can safely add to their sprint backlog. There are a few things worth noting when it comes to calculating velocity. First, there's no such thing as a good velocity or bad velocity. Velocity is simply what the team has historically been able to achieve in a predetermined time box. The next thing is that each team will have a different velocity, especially since each team decides their own point system calibration. It's impossible to compare your team's velocity to another team's. For example, I'm currently on a team of three people, and we're burning down 70 points in a one-week sprint, so our velocity is 70. But on a previous five-person team, our velocity for a two-week sprint was only 120 points. Was one team better or worse than the other? Nope, just different. Once you have a stable velocity and a refined backlog with prioritization and estimates, this unlocks an incredibly valuable superpower. You can now tell your stakeholders and sponsors two important things. You can tell them approximately how long it will take to complete the entire product backlog and how much of your backlog will be completed by a particular time. This ability to confidently predict when things can get done is one of the most powerful tools in Agile and Scrum, in my opinion. Let's imagine that our Virtual Verde team has averaged 200 points in each monthly sprint for the last three months. The team knows they have 1,500 points left in their product backlog. They now can say that it will take them approximately seven or eight sprints to complete the entire product backlog. What if it's July and the team wants to know what will be available by January 1st? No problem, that's five months away. Just go down the backlog from the top and draw a line when you hit 1,000 points. That's a pretty confident estimate based on the past performance of the team. Pretty powerful, right? If you want to pull in the dates, you can use this information to decide to add people to the team and increase velocity, rearrange the priorities, or make other key project decisions. On any given team, it can take multiple sprints to reach a stable velocity, and that's perfectly normal. As the team gets used to estimating and working together, the velocity should begin to stabilize. Now you know how to define velocity, velocity trends, and burn down charts. You also learned a bit about how an Agile team reaches a stable velocity and what that entails. Using these tools is essential to any high-performing Scrum team. They're a powerful means to achieve execution predictability. I'll demonstrate another useful visualization tool in the next video. Meet me there. We learned about the importance of visualizing progress using burndown charts in the last video. And good news, there are other visual tools that can also help a team progress throughout their sprint. The tool we cover in this video may be familiar to you since we briefly covered it in a previous video. It's the Kanban board. Some teams refer to this as the Scrum board rather than the Kanban board. While the two do have minor differences, they're referring to the same basic tool. The Scrum Guide doesn't specify exactly what a Scrum board is, but some Scrum tools available in the market provide a board that adds some features to a Kanban board. These features make it suitable specifically for Scrum. Both boards have three main features that make it a great sprint tracking tool for Scrum teams. There's visualization, work in progress limits, also known as WIP limits, and flow of work. Visualization can be an important strategy for learning and tracking. This Kanban board communicates everything we need to know at a glance. We can point at specific work items on the board we want to discuss, use images with variation in colors and sizes as we check in on work items, and we can notice where the challenges are in our team. Without this visualization, it's not as easy to find out where we can make improvements. These boards make it easy to notice where WIP limits break. We learned earlier in this course that Kanban WIP limits are constraints on how many work items the team actively works on at any given time. This provides focus for the team, which is one of our Scrum values. Have you heard the idea that there's no such thing as multitasking? In Scrum, it can be very true. And the more work you have, the less efficient you can become. 
When you use a Kanban or Scrum board, each team may set a WIP limit based on their configuration and context. This way, it's really obvious to notice when the team is going beyond the WIP limit. And finally, Using a Kanban board can give you a better sense of the flow of work through the team's execution processes. Physical post-it notes or even virtual versions of Kanban or Scrum boards allows the team to experience the movement of work from one phase to another. Using a Kanban or Scrum board, the team will move the items through the following stages, to do, doing, and done. This action often takes place during the daily Scrum, but the team can move items at any time. For example, with our virtual Verde team, let's say that Leo, our plant vendor, has finished the item to finalize contracts with the three top plant vendors we plan to use for our initial launch. Leo will go to the Kanban board and move his item from doing to done and find out what's next to work on. If, for some reason, that was the last thing for him in the sprint, he may reach out to his team to see where he can help a teammate with their work. So to recap, Kanban and Scrum boards are really useful because they help you visualize your progress, set and maintain your team's workload and WIP limits, and give you a sense of the flow of work throughout the team's execution process. Awesome, I'll see you in the next video, where we'll review a few software products that help a Scrum team manage all of this information. We've covered a lot of ground in this section. We've learned all about the various Scrum events and what each of them does to ensure a Scrum team's success. To wrap up this section, we'll review the tools available to implement and facilitate the Scrum and Agile workflows. These can help improve collaboration and keep your workflow transparent. As a refresher, one of Scrum's pillars is transparency. So a Scrum team's success is very dependent on transparency within the team, and tools encourage everyone to be fully aware of progress and updates. These tools will be used to store the product backlog, sprint backlog, and any other essential documentation. Using Scrum tools will help your team keep all of your progress organized and in one centralized place. We've already heard about scheduling and work management, collaboration, and productivity tools. Let's revisit those tools now from the perspective of a Scrum team. Let's talk about scheduling and work management tools. In traditional project management, Applications like Microsoft Project provide you with very powerful schedule and resource management capabilities. In a Scrum team, though, the most critical tool you'll need is something to manage your backlog and your sprints. Jira by Atlassian is a popular Agile team project management tool, and it supports all aspects of team and backlog management. It can be customized for your team and will provide you with a central place to find all things related to your Scrum team your product backlog, your sprint definitions, your velocity, your burndown charts, and much more. After Jira, there are other tools on the market that your team can purchase that provide similar capabilities. Some teams build their own agile tooling inside of spreadsheets too. When it comes time to choose a tool, most of these tools will let you have a free trial period before you make a permanent choice. If you're searching for something simple and fun to try, I recently started using Trello's Kanban capabilities just for my own personal projects. It's helped me plan a move and organize a big birthday party for my dad. Asana is another tool we've referenced in this program that works great for sprint planning and backlog management. Asana helps teams plan and coordinate their work from daily tasks to strategic initiatives. With Asana, everyone can view, discuss, and manage team priorities. This allows teams to understand who is doing what and their time frame for each task. It's great for assigning tasks, automating workflows, tracking progress, and communicating with stakeholders. These applications are built specifically to help a team manage a backlog and their sprints, but there are many activities that these products can't perform. This is where additional tools for documentation, collaboration, and productivity come in. You'll want to use some form of documentation or word processing tool. This ensures that you capture key information about your project in a long format. Many products in this space feature both the documentation and the collaboration all in one tool. Google Docs is a great example of this, but it's not the only one. Spreadsheets, such as Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets, are useful for most teams. You can use spreadsheets to capture backlogs and backlog item information or any number of other pieces of information for your project. You may also want a tool to create presentations, either using Google Slides or the Microsoft equivalent. These presentation tools are used all the time. 
to, you guessed it, present information to the team. And finally, since it's agile, we value individuals and interactions. So it's essential that we have excellent tools for collaboration and communication. The types of collaboration you'll experience on a Scrum team are video conferencing, team and one-on-one -on -one online chats, and emails. These tools will result in huge productivity improvements for your team. They allow teammates to communicate more effectively, get quicker answers, and unblock themselves long before the next day's daily Scrum. There are so many useful applications out there to help Scrum teams maintain the desired transparency between team members. And in Scrum, they decide what to use together. Congratulations on finishing this video in the Google Project Management Certificate. Access the full learning experience, including job search help, and start to earn your official certificate by clicking on the icon. To view the next course in this video, click here. And subscribe to our channel to learn more from Google Career Certificates.